get your Bibles, get your cup of coffee, and let's get to the Word. You know, Pastor has given me the message of winning words. And when he said winning words, I was excited because I love words. I live for words. You know, I'm an exhorter. I'm an encourager. So I give a lot of words. I love to encourage. And you know what? I also love words of affirmation, my love language. I love to receive words. And so my kids always tease me because when I text, it's like several paragraphs. And my kids are like, Mom, you can say all that in a couple of words. And so when I have them text for me, I'm like, I got to read it. Read it out loud. Because guess what? One thing about cheerleaders, they never want their words to get misconstrued. It is the worst feeling when people misunderstand your heart. Amen? So winning with words. But you know what? I want you to really take this word for your own personal lives. You know, when we talk about winning with words, do you know words are very, very powerful? Amen. And I'm not talking about words when you're around saints, when you're around other believers. When we're here blessed and highly favored, we're walking with one another, high-fiving each other in the church. But it's when you're at home. When you're in your car and you get that call and things are not going so well, that's when the rubber hits the road. And that's what you really begin to find out, what is really in you. And so really be open and honest with yourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to do surgery on you. Let him show you you, because that's what he's always doing. He's always showing us ourselves. Because guess what? Your words don't just affect you. They affect everyone in your circle. So we're talking about winning words. Say winning words. Winning words. Now let's think about that. Are you winning in your lives? Are you winning in your marriage? Are you winning with your children? Are you winning on your jobs? Are you winning with your God assignment? Are you? Check your heart. Just want to examine those things. Before you leave here today, my prayer is God will encourage you and the Holy Spirit have something to bring to your attention when you're about to open your mouths. So just for a conscious interrupt, I want you to do this. That's called a conscious interrupt. So as you hear the, the, the words today, the Holy Spirit is going to bring to your attention. Hmm, be careful. All right? So let's get to it. You know, our God is so awesome. He meets us right where we are. So I want to go to our first scripture today. I want you to go to Proverbs 18. You know what? The word tells us that there's power of life and death in the power of our tongue. Death and life are in the power of our tongues. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Do you know we're eating the fruit of our words that we have spoken? I have these boxes here because it came to me. You know what? Words are like packages that will be sent forth to bring fruit in your life at some future date. Packages. Words are like packages that will bring results that you send forward into the atmosphere for delivery at a future date. And the great thing about it is, you know what, I don't know about you guys, but for Christmas, I was ordering a lot of things on Amazon. And the thing about, the great thing about our God is, guess what? You can cancel out those packages. You know, you can send them back. And I want you to know that anything that you, that the Holy Spirit brings to your attention is to say, you know what, I can repent and I can confess that thing to God. And guess what? He is faithful, what? To forgive us, but not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. Amen? So don't get down on yourself, but just receive that. Let's go to the, I want to end the message ver version. The message is like straight street, okay? All right? Let's see it in the message. I want you to really get this. Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. You choose. And so I was just thinking, you know, even as I was preparing this message, you know, I got tested. And the thing about this, the great thing about this is that God always used the messengers here, but he deals with us in life to get ready for what we, we give to you guys from here. And so my daughter had a game yesterday, and she made a pretty big mistake. And, you know, as soon as she made that mistake, she grabbed her face and she looked at me. Now think about, if I had given words that could have crushed her spirit, could have ruined her confidence, but right then a cheerleader had to come alive. We've all made mistakes, honey. Just shake it off. Let's go. Shake it off. You see what I'm saying? So the message you're going to hear today is for us to check ourselves because the Lord is always going to meet us right where we are, but the Holy Spirit equips us. So you see that? So let's think about that. We have a choice. What does it say? You choose. Words kill, words give life, 
They're either poison or fruit. Hmm. So I just, I've been waiting to use this board. <laughs> so we talk about winning, right? And losing words, right? So guess what? We're either giving life with our words or death. It's either blessings. Come on, we're talking about your words. Put your hand over your mouth. Blessings or cursing. We're even imparting joy. Things are going to bring joy and happiness. What? Or what? Depression. Come on, do y'all get this? Right where we live. Our words, my words, your words. We're either choosing to give life or death, blessing or curse. And that's what the Lord tells us. Do you know we're made in God's image? You all know this. Our God is a creator. And because he's a creator, he's made us in his image. Guess what? We can create some things with our words. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that awesome to know that, guess what? I can change any situation if I decree and declare it. You know, I heard a statement said, you know what? You never run at your giants with your mouth closed. Because guess what? Silence is not the answer. But if you will speak to a thing, God can use your words to change any situation. And I just want you to know that our God will meet us right where we are. That's the beauty of this. The beauty of that. So let's go to James 3, 1 through 6. I really want y'all to get the picture. There should be some pictures going up. Not many of y'all should be teachers, my fellow believers. Hmm. So we're going to be tested. If you're a teacher, you're going to be tested in the things that you share with God's people. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That's why we need you all to be praying for Pastor and I. Be praying for the teachers that stand before you. Now, many of you should be teachers. Why? Let's go on to the next verse, verse 2. We all stumble. Say, everybody. everybody. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. I don't know about you, but I miss it. And I'm very careful with my words, but I miss it. That's why I need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. He's the helper. He is a teacher. He's the one that brings things to our remembrance. Amen. The next verse, verse 3, it says, When we put bits in the mouths of the horse, y'all see the horses? I want you to get the picture. The, the bits in the, house, the horse's mouth, make them obey us. That one bit. Y'all see how small that bit is? Inside his tongue is controlling him. Amen. It can turn the whole animal. The whole animal. Do you know when you speak words, whether they're life or death, you know you can turn someone's whole journey into something different. You can change someone's whole atmosphere just by the word you speak. Every last one of us, even parents. We have to be so careful what we speak over our kids. We can shift them either way. Amen? Let's go, to, let's go on. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Y'all see the rudder? The rudder's going to go up there. Whenever the pilot wants it to go, that little rudder gets to stirring and gets to turning. Y'all see how small that rudder is? You see how big that ship is? We can only see the bottom of it. But can you imagine? Just that rudder can shift the whole thing. My mouth. My tongue. The power of life and death is right here. And what I say to myself, what I speak over my life, and what I speak over the lives of others. Amen? Amen. Next verse. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body. Imagine that. But it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest set on fire by a small spark. Next verse. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and itself set on fire by hell. You know what? At the end of the service, we're going to give an invitation for those to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I can't say enough about the Holy Spirit. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, you're yielding yourself. You're yielding your tongue. You're yielding everything to the Holy Spirit right there at that moment. Guess what? When you pray in the Holy Spirit, because even, even this, this weekend, even though I passed the test with my daughter's game, but then afterwards, my kids have been having a spat, and later I found out they had a little physical situation, a little tap here, a little touch there. 
And I told the little one, I told the young one, because she's young, I said, don't touch my children. I just simply, you're the baby, don't touch my children, my older children, because it's, I want honor, I want to teach honor and respect for the older and the, and the family. And you know, later, my baby girl said, Mom, can I tell you something? Your words hurt me. Because, Mama, when you said that, it felt like I wasn't your child. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? And that was just a light moment. But something so small can mean such, such a big thing in someone's life. But I'm so thankful that I was prayed up, prayed in the Holy Spirit, because he allowed her to have conviction to mention it to me. But if she had mentioned it to me, guess what? Sometimes those words go down deep, and it causes a, a spirit of rejection to set in. And then she'll begin to see me through the eyes of the lenses of rejection. And we never want the enemy to use our words. Do you know the enemy is coming for your words? Amen. Is he not like a roaring lion walking to and fro out the whole earth, seeking who he may devour? Because he comes to what? Steal, to kill, and destroy. And he wants to ruin relationships. He wants to kill your purpose. Amen. He wants to get you distracted. The enemy is coming for your words. So I just want you all to know it. Be very mindful of what you say. Be very not mindful. My, my, my husband always mentions this. He says sometimes the wrong words can stick around like a 40-year mortgage. How many of you ever heard him say that? <laughs> but as you know, it's so interesting. We had some friends that have been married for a decade or so, madly in love, but then the gentleman went through a major situation where he got sidetracked, depressed, and they went through counseling. And in the counseling session, a little after the counseling session, her husband asked her one question. And at that, mo that moment, she was speaking the truth. But that moment, they were the wrong words. And those words, that man remembered. And he left that marriage. And as all of those words, he has been wandering away from God. We had to be so mindful of what we say when people are vulnerable, when people are going through, when they're going, in situate, going deeply into situations that, that only God can get them out of, when people are going through hurt, hurting times. And say you are married, you're in a marriage, and you know what, things are getting hot and heavy, that might be a time to put your hand over your mouth and leave the room and go somewhere and pray. If you got your prayer language, you pray in the Spirit because the Holy Spirit will give you instructions and you will know that it's Him because that's what He does. He meets us right where we are. Our God is faithful. He will meet us right where we are. So our words have power. Our words have power. And I want us to, I want to share a story. You know, talk about the enemies coming for our words. You know, it's when the pressure is on. When the pressure is on, what you really believe comes out. Amen. You know, the word tells us, from the abundance of the heart. What is that? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What we've been putting in on a regular basis, whether you've been reading the word, whether you've been coming to the, the church, you know, whether you're spending time in worship, when you're before the Lord, guess what? The Holy Spirit has something to pull out. But if you're just an empty vessel, you come in to serve, you don't sit, you don't get the word, guess what? In the right moment... Something else is going to come out. That's why we have to be so mindful of what we put in. Be so mindful of what we put in to our spirits. Because that's what the Lord's going to be able to pull out. The Holy Spirit, put, He takes out what we put in. So I'm going to go, let's go to Mark 11, 22 through 24. And many of these are scriptures you've seen before. But I want us to see them with new eyes. Because we're talking about what? Winning words! Winning words. We will win with our words. And no matter where we are, the Holy Spirit will cause us to win if we yield to Him. Amen? Amen. So let's go to Matthew. Mark. No, Mark 11, 22 to 24. Is it up there? If not, let me get to my, my scriptures. I want us to see this. Because we have, Pastor and I have lived this stuff right here. I know I have on my face. <laughs> Amen. Is it there? Okay. So let's go there. Let's read it. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Before this happened, the Lord had seen a fig tree, and because the fig tree did not have figs, he cursed it at the root. So this is what they're coming to. For surely, let's go back to that verse before, 22. 
So Jesus answered and said to them, because they're saying, Here, Lord, here's the tree that you cursed. It is dried up from the root. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in who? God. In God. Next. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Y'all see that word mountain? You say, but be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. What mountains are in your life? What are some things that you're dealing with that seems like a mountain? Now you can't even imagine getting over. You don't know how God's going to work it out. It seems like it is too big for you. You've done everything you know to do and it's still a mountain. Do you know you can speak it? You can speak the words. And as you speak it, guess what? And even if you can't understand how it's going to work out, speak it. Do not run at your mountain or your giant with your mouth closed. He needs your words. You have to declare it. This mountain here, Pastor and I had a mountain. You've heard him tell it, but I want to tell it from my perspective. <laughs> you know, because you know what? When you're a wife... Oh my gosh. You know what? When you're a wife, because you remember, because we, we want to be properly submitted under our husbands. You know what? And sometimes, ladies, you know what? We think we have no control, but let me tell you, you and your father, y'all got some major influence. Major influence. So, you know what? For 10 years, my husband played with the Arizona Cardinals. And we were real frugal. You know, we saved what we what pastor made. And, you know, we lived way below our means. And we love to teach the word and teach other players about making wise investments. But you know what? Pastor and I made an unwise investment. We invested in six dealerships. And you know what? It was not, our, it was not God's will. You ever heard the saying, if it's God's will, his bill. But if it's not God's will, it's what? Your bill. And you know what? And those dealerships were not a good investment, but you know what? Over time, you know, we tried to make it work, and it came a time, right around the time when we started this church, in our basement. This is the part most people hear, that, that part right there. You know what? Our dealerships are losing millions of dollars, like a money pit. And we had the best of intentions. We're major tithers, major givers. Anything God tells us to give, we gave it. But you know what? We were going through. Best of intentions with the dealerships. And at that time, God called us to the ministry. Our dealerships are losing millions. Pastors finally retired. And so at this time, I'm wondering how to be a pastor's wife. We're sitting on a huge house in Ladue, paying for the dirt. You know, you pay for that zip code. <laughs> yep. And this is right around the time of 2007. You know, when the housing market was real funny. And here we are, the Lord tells us to start a church in the basement. And I'm like depressed. And so you know what, ladies, let me give you a tip. My husband, when he's going through, when he has to make major decisions, when pressure is so heavy on him, he's so, he be so careful with those words. When pressure is so heavy, he kind of goes into a cave where he doesn't do much talking. So here I am in St. Louis, no family here. You know, we're called to start the church, the dealership's losing money, and I'm feeling like God is so far off, I can't see him. But one thing about God, it's about relationship. That relationship with Jesus will sustain you. When you can't feel nothing, when you don't feel like nothing's there, that is when he's closest. Because you know what? At that very time, at that very time when I'm going through my private hell, pastor's trying to figure out what to do because he's an um, honorable God and honorable guy and he's a great steward but we made this bad decision but God he used that decision because at this time you know relationships so the whole time I'm going through I'm crying snotting in tears in the basement the Lord began to teach me about worship so we talk about this worship up here it's not this right here it's when you're at home by yourself with the audience of one when nobody sees so the Lord was teaching me about worship and the whole time I wanted to make this clear and plain I use the board. They told me how to erase this stuff, so y'all just stay with me here. But I want you to tell you, this stuff is real. When, no, when we leave this place right here, this is when we'll be tested. And we want to pass the test. We want to make sure we speak in what? Winning words. Is that right? Yes. So let me tell you some of the things that were going through my heart. So as, as this is going on, I'm in the basement, and this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, Lord, please don't let it be bankruptcy and I'm saying you know what God we givers 
We, do, we did our part. Our part, right? You know what I'm saying? I knew this wasn't a good investment. <laughs> you know how the Holy Spirit, you know what? Things start, the, the enemy will use your flesh and your emotion to remind you, you know, I knew this wasn't the one. I knew we shouldn't have been, I knew this would not work. We should have sold. <laughs> we should have sold. This is what I'm saying. I want you to say, you know what? Let me tell you this. This is what I'm saying, and I'm not talking to human beings. I'm telling this to God. I'm mumbling. I am mumbling. But even though I'm saying all this, Lord, please don't let it be bankruptcy. Please, fear is coming. But like I said, relation, remember I told you about relationship? So Lord began to teach me about worship. He had me reading a book about worship. And what I would do, I would go in my basement. I would bring my journal, and here it is. I have it marked to the actual page where I wrote out my prayer. So I would go to my basement, get on my knees, pitch black, and I would be blessed in my worship music. Blessed in my worship music, saying, God, you're awesome. God, you're mighty. Lord, you know all things. You know the plans and purposes for our lives. Oh, God, you saw all this. You saw our dumb mistakes. All of this, I'm being real. I'm blowing up my God, and he is so awesome. Tell him how awesome he is. And I begin to pray in the spirit. That tongues, that thing is real right there. Praying in the spirit. And as I'm praying in the spirit, the Lord downloads to me instructions. You know what he says? Go upstairs. He says, I got Aeneas. I got him. Don't worry about him. And then he says, go upstairs and ask him what you should be praying for. Leave my place. He's in the kitchen. Honey, what do you want me to pray for? Concerning the dealerships. Well, we got consultants coming. All right. Go to my basement. Father, you're awesome. You're mighty, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You're an incredible God. These, these, you know, the consultants are coming, Lord God, and you're going to give them wisdom and direction. The whole week, I'm driving around. Lord, the consultants, you're going to give them wisdom. You're going to tell them exactly how to help us to get out of this mess, Lord. I begin to say winning words. So what I begin to do? Winning words. Everybody say it. Worship. Worship. Winning words, praying in the Spirit. Come on now, it's not spooky. It is a gift and it's for us. Praying in the Spirit. And you know what's so awesome? See how God, He connects the dots because guess what? Wherever two shall agree is touching anything the earth, it shall be done, right? So I'm, God has me praying. He's downloading me what to ask Pastor to pray for. As I'm asking Him, He's in, He and I are in agreement. All the while, me and God are going through this. This is not pastor. The Lord told me, leave pastor alone. It's me and him. Me and him. We're doing this thing. So now we got the power of agreement. Agreement is working. Winning words. Agreeing with the word of God. Power of agreement. Agree with the word. We work in the word and I don't even know it. So I go upstairs, honey, okay? So consultants have come and gone. Then I'm like, honey, okay, what do you want me to pray for next? Blue Sky offer to sell the dealerships. So I'm like, okay, Lord, you're awesome. You're mine. This is every night in the pitch black. Nobody sees this but my God. Our God sees when we worship. We talk about the drop-down principle. This is what it is. When you are alone, I don't care if you at work, all hell is broken out at work, go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom, drop it down, humble yourself. And say, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know why you got me here. But God, I am here. Use me, God. You are awesome and mighty. You are great, Lord. You know the plans and purposes for my life. And you know what? Let me tell you. God told me to ask pastor what to pray for. Pray for a blue sky offer for someone to buy the dealerships. Get this. Absorb the debt. Let me tell you something. Do you know that God sent one gentleman on our, listen to this, on our dumb mistakes, us doing our own will, he sent someone to buy the dealerships and absorb the debt. And let me tell you this. So you know what? So when, when Pastor had to appear before the licensing board, the automotive licensing board and the buyers there one of the gentlemen on the board said man 
This man must be an angel. Uh, we have never seen someone come by these kind of dealerships in the condition they are and absorb the debt. It was a witness to the world. They saw God move. It was supernatural. But you will see, family, it's not about what we do right here. We come together to connect, to get our instructions. So when we go out there, we are living victorious, winning, a winning life. The Christian life is not a boring life. It's edge of the sea living. We got to practice what we get here. Winning words is what we speak when the pressure is on. And even if you start murmuring like I was, because I have relationship. You got relationship with Jesus? He will begin to minister to you. But you know what? If you're not filled with the Spirit, do not hesitate. You want the helper. You want the help on the inside of you so he can give you instructions. It is an awesome power, and he's given it to every believer if you will ask for it. Amen? So let's go on over to numbers. I want to close with this last story here. So this is in the promised land. Y'all know about the children of Israel? Once they left Egypt, they were in the promised land, uh, seeking out, they're going out in circles, and they're coming on the mouth of the promised land. And the Lord gives Moses instructions. And he began to tell Moses, I want you to send out 12 spies. These will be leaders. Everybody say leaders. Leaders. Leaders have influence. Say, leaders have influence. Leaders have influence. Choose 12 leaders, one from each tribe. They will be the leader of their tribe, and we're going to send them out. We want them to survey the land. Find out, is the land fertile? How big is the land? Is it fortified? Is it walled? Is there fruit growing there? And if you have a chance, will you cut off some fruit and bring it back? God told Moses exactly what to tell them to go and survey. Do you know they went for 40 days? For 40 days, these leaders, leaders have influence. Pay attention to this. If you are a supervisor, you are a manager, you are a parent, you are a leader anywhere in your life, pay attention to this. God gave them very specific things to check off. Numbers 13. So he sends them out. And guess what? They come back. They come back with the report. And it says, They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. And so one of the things they brought back was this fruit, the grapes. Can you imagine seeing fruit like this? Even though they saw fruit like this, let's go on. Go to my next scripture. This I'm breaking this up so we won't spend so much time on it. So that's Numbers 13, 26 to 23. Let's go into my next number of scriptures. You have them? Okay. And that night, all the members of so here they are. They come back in with their port. And guess what? Of the twelve, all the ten, the ten tell them what they could not do. That night, all the members of the community raised their voice and wept aloud. Do you know why they wept aloud? Because there were 10 that came back with a negative report. And they began, the children of Israel, it's too big. The people are too big there. You know, the, the land would devour us up. They kept seeing what they saw. They kept seeing what they saw for 40 days. Not they saw the fruit. Not they saw the lusciousness of the land. They said they brought back figs and pomegranates. They saw the great things that God had promised them. Do you know if God is putting an assignment in your heart, it's for you to fulfill it? Do you know what? If he has given a dream to you and it seems bigger than life, and it means you may have to go back to school, it may mean that, guess what? Even though you don't have a degree, you have to trust that he's going to put you in the right position. Guess what? He will allow you to jump over people if he has assigned you to that place. Do you know if God has given you the dream, he has already measured out the challenges. He already knew when he told Moses to tell them, check out the land, see if it's fertile. Check out if it's fortified or not. He already knew this. But he was test. I believe he was testing them. Just like the Lord would test us in our leadership. So that night, all the members of the community, all the Israelites grumbled. Go back up. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron because of what the ten came back talking about. 
They kept talking about the circumstances. They kept talking about how big the giants were. And yes, there were giants in the land. But God already knew that. Do you know what? God already knows the challenges that are going to come against you the, the, for the very thing that he's called you to. But guess what? You're called to do it. It says that even though it's fortified, that he has already dropped their protection. That's what the word tells. He's already dropped their protection. Guess what? If there are some challenges already, he's already dropped the gates so that you can march in. But guess what? He just wanted to see, do you trust him? Will you be bold enough to take the step? Do you know he will meet you there? So it says they grumble. So this is, remember, these are leaders grumbling. Spread the bad news. Leader, supervisor, the boss has come down with a vision. You can't see how it's going to happen. What are you saying? Because guess what? The people are watching you. The people were watching the 12. They want to see what did they see. They went for 40 days. What did they see? And there was only two. They gave a different report. And here they are. They want to stone Moses and Aaron. So why didn't he just, why didn't God just send us back? Let's choose a leader. Let's go back to Egypt. They would rather go back. Let me tell you something. It's nothing like, even though God has called you something big, it's nothing like stepping out, you tremble and you trust. Because guess what? You know what? If God has called you to something and you sitting on a bench, it is a miserable place. It is a miserable place. You would rather be in the game, even though you don't know what you're doing. But when you're in the game, it's like he knows exactly how to throw you the ball. He knows exactly where, show you where to go. And that's what he was doing with these leaders. I got y'all. Just say what I've been trying to teach you the whole time. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. They'd rather go die in Egypt than to go to the promised land they've been talking about all this time. If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Next. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Listen what they're saying. Everybody say, saying. saying. Losing words. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Next. And they said to each other, they said to each other, they begin to say to each other, what are we saying to each other? Leaders, and even if you're under leaders, what are you saying? Are you taking the bad report? Are you saying, I don't know, but God's got us. God's got it. He's got a plan. God's got a plan. What are you speaking? Are you speaking winning words or words that are going to deliver some bad fruit in the future? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Next. Then Moses and Aaron fell down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Next. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who explored the land, tore their clothes because they are grieved. Do you know what? Let me tell you something. To speak winning words, it's going to take courage and it's going to take strength. You're going to be bold about this right here. But guess what? You know what? You know, at the water cooler, at the lunch table, they're going to be talking about what's, going, what's coming down the pike. But guess what? Are you going to sit there and listen to the grumbling? Are you going to shift the atmosphere? So you know what? God's got us. I know they're laying off people. Guess what? I've enjoyed my time here. God's got He's providing for me. What are you speaking? According to your word, be it unto you. What are you saying? Are you able to shift the atmosphere? Or are you just going to listen what they're saying? Leaders, where are you? Even if you don't understand what's coming down the pike, you speak life. Because guess what? God's eyes are on us. Remember I told you that the enemy is looking to see what's coming out your mouth? Do you know what God is listening for your words to? Because later on, you know, it goes on and says, you know, those 10, those 10 spies who are leaders, do you know what? God executed them. He couldn't have that going through the camp. And he told the people, you know what? As you have said in my ears, so, it, so be it unto you. Do you know those who are 20 and older would die? You will not see the promised land. You will not see it. But your children will be as shepherds in, these, in the desert for 40 years. And then I will take them into my promised land. Do you know what Caleb and Joshua went into the promised land? New leaders. Bold. You're going to have to be bold and courageous. You're going to be willing to go with God, but nobody's going. 
You begin to speak to your children when you don't see no fruit at all. You begin to declare over their lives that they shall do all that God has called them to do. They are anointed and appointed. They are approved by me. And I will speak life over them even if I don't see no kind of fruit at all. What are you speaking? Because whatever you speak, the package is going to be delivered. The package is going to be delivered. But you know what? Even if you have spoken wrong things, do you know what? Our God is so merciful. He always gives us a way out. Just like he gave the children of Israel a way out. If only they had repented. If only they had repented. Do you know what? God would have met them right where they were. And that's where your God is. He wants to meet you right where you are. So family, hope you, you've gotten something out of this lesson today. Winning words. You will win with your words.